So my name, as some Ashley mentioned, is Sasi Balasubramaniam, and I'm the Director of Research, co-directing the TSSG with uh, Kevin Doolin. So I'm currently the um, PI of Vista Mill, and um, what I'm actually going to be presenting today is some of the platform research that we're doing in um, Vista Mill, which is research that will hopefully create new solutions within, let's say, five to ten years, uh, targeting largely from the um, basic science. So this is the, going to be the outline of my short talk today. I'll start with a very, very quick introduction, and then I'll get into a new area called molecular communications that we're actually looking at in um, Vista Mill, uh, concepts of what we call virtual digital cow, and how we can also use that for biocomputing as well for agri-tech. And lastly, I'll touch on very quickly on a new concept we call programmable ingredients. So um, we all know the motivation of what this, um, the whole idea of agri-tech really is basically to develop new solutions that we can actually target for food security and sustainability going forward into the future here. These are some figures that I got from, you know, it's actually quite old figures from 2009, but it's actually forecasted that the demand, the food demand is gonna rise by up to 70%, 70%. This is not only gonna be due to the actual population increase, but also the actual effects of climate change itself. So what our vision here is to see how we can use um, new and future technologies from ICT, which we've seen a tremendous amount of developments over the last few years um, with various different types of communication networks being spread out through various different um, land areas, even not only talking about core infrastructures of the you know, base stations that can actually communicate signals down to your mobile phone, but even miniature devices that we can see implanted into the various parts of the environment, transmitting various different types of information over this communication network. So this diagram here, our aim here is to look at how we can get these communication systems to overlay on top of the agricultural infrastructure that we have and to actually collect various different types of data um, from the different parts of the infrastructure, allowing us to do analysis to give us um, key insights into how we can actually improve productivity and efficiency. So one area that we're actually looking at in the TSSG at the moment is actually looking towards 6G. Many of you may actually already know about 4G, 5G is actually rolling out right now, but we're actually looking at new types of communication systems we believe will be deployed by the year 2030 and beyond. And one of that area is actually called molecular communications. So what exactly is molecular communications? When we, when we talk of con conventional communication systems, especially most of you would think of your mobile phones, which usually communicate using conventional electromagnetic waves. Um, you can see there's a picture of a base station that's actually sending signals and various different types of other types of data down to your mobile phone. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not only just to your phone, but even miniature devices. And these communicate through these electromagnetic waves, which is pretty much all around us everywhere at different frequencies. Right? But what if we actually want to communicate between, let's say, small devices, and especially if we have these miniature devices that could be not only implanted in the animal itself, but even deep within the actual soil. And they're actually miniature and very, very small in scale. So here's an example of an implantable device that was actually developed um, by a research group in Spain back in 2013. It's a miniature device. They implanted it right into a cell. So the scale is actually constructed out of you know, components and they were able to implant this into the cell to actually collect information of the pressure that's been applied on the actual cell itself. So you can see the dimensions of this is actually very small, comparable to pretty much just a few tens of micrometers in scale. Right? So if we want to actually have these devices implanted to collect data from us, the big question here is that how do we allow them to actually communicate? Do we actually allow them to actually communicate through electromagnetic waves? The problem here is that when you miniaturize the actual antenna down to such a miniature scale, a lot of the signaling that we're talking about here is going to be very, very high frequency. And those frequencies will never ever actually penetrate through tissue. So you can never ever have these devices communicate with each other or even enable us to actually extract information out of them. So the whole idea here is that can we use the natural communication process that naturally occurs within animals or even within the actual human body itself, and that's actually using molecules. So can we allow these devices to be engineered so that they can interact with the cells, or some of them can even actually be bi biological in nature. We engineer them to actually produce mo information molecules and they can transmit between the devices and hopefully to an external device and onto the actual internet itself. 
So that's the whole area of molecular communications. And you can actually see the definition in red there. The ability to actually create communication systems and networks that's made out of biological components and processes that are actually found in nature. So we have a lot of this communication existing within the animal itself or within the actual human body and at various different types of scales, whether it's just molecular signaling that actually occurs between cells in a tissue, all the way to different organs actually communicating with each other using hormones. So our question here is that, can we override on top of those communication systems so that we can transmit key information to implantable devices? So the long-term vision of this is that for, for 6G itself is that we're going to actually transform from what has happened between 1G to 5G. Up to now, we've only been talking about electromagnetic waves that has been transmitted between the actual infrastructure. But what we believe will happen into 6G is what we call a signal medium conversion. So you actually have electromagnetic waves transmitted from a base station and then from the base station deep down into possibly the soil, up into the plants itself, or even into the animals, down to the molecule level to actually understand how these small miniature devices are actually collecting information so that we can now open up and widen the spectrum of information that we can actually collect from the animals itself. <coughs> Excuse me, itself. So how can we actually apply this into the, um, the, the, the Acritech uh, uh, scene? So our long-term vision is to see whether we can create a concept, what we call a virtual digital cow, which means that can we actually simulate the actual organs and interworkings of the actual animal itself, in particular, the actual microbiome and the gut of the actual cow, because a lot of the diseases, believe it or not, actually starts within the actual, the bacteria that are actually within the microbiome itself. And as you're actually, actually feeding different types of, say, for example, feed into it for different types of cows, you might want to actually understand how the actual microbiome is actually functioning itself. And in the event that they're actually sick, then you'd actually then be applying certain types of antibiotic drugs into them. And you'd also want to maybe have a very deep insight into actually understand the effects of that will also have in the microbiome. So our big long-term vision is to see whether we can literally create a digital copy of the actual animal itself sitting within the actual data center, allowing us to actually simulate and understand a lot of the functions that's happening within the microbiome. So the way we want to actually do this, sorry, the way we want to actually do this is not, not only actually understanding and modeling at the cell level where we actually look at individual cells within the actual cow itself, within the actual microbiome. It could be the tissue of the, of the actual gut and the bacteria is actually communicating and signaling between them, but even up all the way to how the actual tissues will actually communicate between so tissues and tissue will communicate and even actually organ to organ communication. So you can have a very deep insight using this multi-scale communication all the way from molecular scale to the cellular scale up down up to the tissue level itself. So for every small, even drug molecule that actually comes in, we can find out how it actually impacts at the tissue level and even down to even at the cell level itself. How those cells will then react and respond and produce different types of molecules, whether they'll accept the drugs or whether they'll not accept the drugs and what are the actual consequences from that. So what we are actually interested in in, in Vista Milk is to do microbiome communications and using simulation modeling that we can do in the actual data center itself. So the way, the way we look at it is that we take the data that is actually a lot of data that's out, out there, in particular microbiome data, data that involves how different bacterial populations are actually communicating with each other. We take that data and we reverse engineer that. And once we reverse engineer that, we try to find out which particular bacteria species are actually communicating. Can we identify the actual genetic circuits responsible for actually communicating those signals? Can we then simulate those pathways and from there simulate how the bacteria are actually interacting with each other? So here actually shows an example of one of the works that we're actually trying to do. It's an animation for a population-based simulation of two populations of bacteria, we actually collected data from a population of bacteria within the yogurt itself. And you can actually see that as the bacteria are actually moving and signaling between each other, they'll actually change their response based on the color because they dynamically change. So actually, when you actually change the feed or even the, let's say, for example, drug molecules that you apply to them, they'll actually respond by producing different molecules as they're communicating with each other. 
so we can go deep down inside to cell level communication and as well as the population level itself. So, um, so what we're also interested here is also how we can also engineer those cells actually create specialized communication between them. And it's coming from an area called synthetic biology. What our intention here is to use software tools. Here's an example on the right there called the Cello programming language. You can actually enter very high level functions you would like the cells to do. The software will then produce and design these genetic circuits. You then actually plug them into the actual bacteria itself or any other type of cells, and then you can create new specialized functions from that. A lot of this has been applied to humans to actually treat very different types of diseases. We also believe it can also be applied to animals as well. And the way we want to do it is to actually develop biological computers. When we think of biological computers, the first thing that comes to our mind are actually silicon technology, right? Especially down to the single gate level. And you can see here two examples of an OR gate and an AND gate. So they'll take in different types of input, process those inputs, and then give an output, right? And then when you actually assemble all these different gates itself, you get a massive circuit, and these circuits are actually what you find in your processes you have in your phone or your laptops. And they're built, built out of silicon technology. Now, the question here is that do we want to stick such type of a, a silicon technology non-organic device into the actual animal itself? You, number one, you have problems with biocompatibility. Number two, you have problems with powering itself. So if I want to have this type of computing so that I can compute whether there's different types of uh, biomarkers or enzymes that indicate diseases, how do I do that without using computing technology? So what we've done is that we've come to look at how we can actually engineer bacteria that will react like as if it's a digital gate. So you can see here is a picture of a population of bacteria. And instead of electrical signals input one and two coming in, we actually have molecule signals coming in, green and, and, and this blue. And the bacteria are actually engineered to actually compute those molecules. And then once it computes, it will produce a red molecule that actually comes out of it. Right? And here's an example of a single AND gate that we, we, we created. So we did some um, experimental work with another research group in Waterford IT, PMBRC. You can see here's an example of a single AND gate. And if it's actually clear, it's basically either a one, zero, 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 or zero, one input. And if it's actually yellow, it's actually both input one, one going in, and it's actually producing an output molecule coming out. So what we want to do next step is to see whether we can then hook these different gates up together into a circuit. And in other words, do different computing. You can see in this example here, you have two, four inputs coming in and then it actually produces one output. And we can actually 3D print a pill, and then in each of these compartments, we actually put different bacteria that represent different gates. So you can actually have the communication between the population, it will be basically like communication between the gates, and it will be literally a virtual com digital biocomputer, I should say. So what we want to do, sorry, is that 3D print, put this into a pill, and we've already started um, collaborating with SEAM, um, research center in WIT, they're producing this polymer-based pill that will allow us to actually put this group of bacteria inside so that it will actually do the computing. And then what we want to do after that is to see whether we can develop what we call a bacterial molecular computing chip, where we can have different compartments, microfluidic compartments, and you put these different populations of bacteria in. It could be an AND gate, it could be a switch, and you put in different samples into those compartments and those bacteria will actually sense and find out what's actually wrong with that particular sample. It could be any type of samples you can put in into all those different compartments, and you can hook this up to ho hopefully in your mobile phone so you can do diagnostic testing out on the field itself. So what next and how far can we really go? And in particular, can we actually couple this um, with other ICT technologies going forward into the future? So what we think we can happen, our big massive grand vision of the future is that once we can create this virtual cow that we can actually simulate within the actual data center, starting say for example, the microbiome that I mentioned earlier, we can then have this synthetic biology software tool that will allow us to actually engineer the actual cells itself. They can be nano sensors or synthetic sensors. We can plug them into the actual animal itself and see how it's actually functioning, collect that data, and simulate it and view it digitally through our data center itself. So 
We've all, many of you may have heard of what they call human on a chip. This was actually developed at Wee's Institute at Harvard, um, where you actually take different organs of a human body and you can actually put them all into an actual chip here. Here's an example of what you have a brain, a liver, and you can even have other types of organs such as kidney. And you can actually have different pipes connecting between them representing a circulatory system. So when you actually apply different drugs into one of the compartments, say for example, the liver, you can find out how that's actually producing molecules that might affect the brain or even other organs itself. We're actually involved in a future emerging technology proposal that's actually due in next week, looking at how we can create such type of a chip infrastructure that could allow us to develop new types of therapeutic molecules for COVID-19. But what we are interested to do is to see whether we can bring this technology to do future drug analysis for animals in the future. So what will happen is that between your virtual cow that actually sits in the data center, you'd actually have what we like to call a cow on a chip, having all the different types of the organs that are represented within the actual cow sitting on all this chip. You can test the drugs. If it doesn't work well, you fine tune it once again digitally in your data center, test it again on your cow on a chip. And once it's all satisfactory, it's working well, you then apply it onto the animal itself. So it'll save money of actually, number one, doing animal testing. Number two, it will also give you a more precision view of how you actually want to apply these drugs to the actual animal itself. Um, I'm coming to the last part of my presentation now. Um, one of the things that we're also interested in Vista Milk is how we can actually personalize milk by actually manipulating or programming their ingredients. Many of you know that, you know, when you walk into the actual supermarket itself, there's numerous different types of milk brands that's actually available and they have different nutrient compositions. And the whole idea here is that so that it'll actually be able to tailor for the different types of people who have different types of allergies, right? But we actually have to go beyond that as well because we all vary from one, one person to another. It depends not only on our physical uh, composition, our genetic background, but even our daily activities age and also the amount of physical exertion that we actually do. Right? So we will all process the different types of milk differently. So what we're trying to do is to try to create kind of like a virtual gut model that once again we can actually simulate within the actual computer system, seeing, observing how we can see how the digestive process is done and how those enzymes would then propagate through the circulatory system and spread to the different types of organs. Right? so that we can personalize and say, okay, for me, because of my heart rate, my blood pressure, I should be taking this type of ingredients compared to someone else who might have a different composition. So the way we're actually doing it, sorry, the way we're actually doing it is starting from the actual digestion process within the actual gut. We're trying to create a computer model there, in particular focusing on how we can actually do uh, model the digestive process of milk, understands the enzymes that's actually being reproduced, the amino acids and the fatty acids that is actually being produced, and how those enzymes would then go into the circulatory system. We can actually model and see based on, we, we actually try to take a circulatory system, a real circulatory, circulatory, circulatory system of a human being, and then observe how those molecules will actually move along the blood vessels up until the target tissue, the kidney or the heart, how those molecules will they'll go into those um, tissues and get, actually get absorbed. So by changing the actual variations and the composition of the nutrients, we can then personalize and say that, okay, for Sasi, you need a composition of A, B, and C as follow as opposed to some other individual. And that brings me to the end of my presentation today. Thank you very much.